setting up shop. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Setting Up Shop, the podcast with myself, Dan, and my co-hosts, Heidi and Rasmus, where we're going to talk about all sorts of things that can help you take your hobby from a hobby to a business. Hopefully, you'll make some money from it. Hopefully, you'll have a lot of fun. Um, and if nothing else, remember, we're not professionals. We're on the journey with you. And we're, we're here in your ear to uh, help you along when you're probably making things or cutting stock or uh, doing anything to distract yourself from that one task you really should be doing. <laughs> so this week, we're going to, or this episode, I should say, depending on when you're listening to them, we're going to be talking about uh, diversifying your revenue streams. And this can come in various different ways. And it's not entirely about just making money in different ways, although that is important. So first of all, I'm just going to uh, bring things home a little bit. I was um, attending a webinar not so long ago and being run by a lady who has been mentoring crafts businesses for over 25 years. And one of the things that she stated, which is exceptionally true, but is always hard to hear, is that in reality for a craftsperson's business, if you are spending more than 40% of your time manufacturing products, then it will be very difficult for your business to succeed. That's 40% of the total amount of time you have available for that business. That really is the maximum of time you should be spent hands-on making things. Now, you can make that time bigger if you start getting down the roots of employing other people to do admin and marketing and all of that kind of good stuff. Um, but the reality is when you're in your first few years, that's going to be very difficult. So as a consequence of this generating turnover, generating interest in your business means you you can't just sit in your workshop and make the thing, no matter how much that's what you want to be doing. Um, if all you want to do is sit in your workshop and make the thing, then probably running it as a business isn't necessarily the thing for you. But we can talk about that in the future. Um, the obvious way of making money that all of us talk about is going to a market and selling your stuff face to face to people or having your online website, whether it's an Etsy store um, or selling through Instagram and all of that kind of good stuff. Um, but the reality is that no matter how much work you put into that, it's very difficult to generate the amount of income that you need in order to sustain your business just through that one portal. And also, as we've experienced recently, certainly earlier in this year in 2024, there was a period of time where um, Instagram and Facebook were down for like 24 hours. And if that's where you generate the majority of your revenue or the majority of your marketing from, and it's suddenly taken away from you, this can cause you problems. So it's always good to have a number of different avenues where income can come from. Um, so we're, we're going to gloss over retail sales and we'll kind of lump wholesale into that category as well. Um, so those are ones that both require an awful lot of effort on your part of face-to-face -face or phone calls or emails, all that kind of good stuff. And I'm going to pick on each of my co-hosts briefly to give me an example of something else they do um, that can generate revenue or certainly lead to generating revenue um, that they have experienced already. And Rasmus, I'm going to go first with you because you've got an obvious one we talked about in the pre-show, um, if you wouldn't mind yeah. just uh, outlining that for us. Well, apart from the obvious dimension of actually just making products and flogging them at markets or website or whatever, uh, I also have made a couple of different digital plants that I'm selling. And that's one of those kind of passive income things, to use a buzzword, that is really nice if you can do it correctly and can hit a bit of market where you put, you put into work once it just lives on its own on the internet, especially for me when I've done it through Etsy. They are running all of the offsite ads. They take care of everything. They take a cut from the sale, but considering it's something that I put three hours into way back when, and then just keep making money for me every single year, that's kind of a no brain in my world because it just keeps on working. Yeah, no, absolutely. So um, digital plans for a product, uh, like you say, you, so you've put in approximately three hours time into that. And how, how long ago was that? I guess that's just about three years ago now. Okay. 
And you're, you're finding, uh, given the nature of the product, so for those who aren't aware, this will be plans for making a metal rose, isn't it? Yeah, the, the yeah. specific of the roses, and I'm working on plans for a few other products. But of course, being Norwegian and speaking a bit of English, I, of course, want everything to be bilingual and translate things and all of it. So I'm making a bit of extra work for myself. But <laughs> for example, uh, one thing that... The only thing that really takes time when making a plan is figuring out how to describe it or how to convey the information in a good way. Yeah. And as soon as you sort of figured out, like, no, no, here's the bullet points of things that needs to be said, the language doesn't matter. But it is sort of the structure of how to lay everything out so that it looks like a nice product, even though it is, quote, unquote, just a digital file. Yeah, so that's uh, that's certainly a product that... Um isn't necessarily 100% unique to you but the way that you're selling it is is you you've described the way that you do it and therefore it is a process that you're doing um and you're able to sell that as a product separately that no one's going to claim copyright on or or anything like that so you haven't yeah. got to worry about those kind of issues but equally there isn't a huge amount of people selling that particular product where you sell it in this case Etsy um there's a couple of yeah. others selling it on selling things like this on Etsy. But of course, what I'm trying to win at is having the ones that is the easiest to understand, the yeah. YouTube videos to go with it. And it uh, when you print out the template, if you decide to go that way of it, it, it looks really nice on the paper. It's yeah. not a big thing, but I think that helps. And it feels like it has helped a lot because it keeps on sharing. Yeah, it's a bit, bit like the thumbnails on YouTube or Instagram, isn't yeah. it? If your first picture isn't nice, then people aren't going to click on it and follow through and want, want to sort of interact with that particular product. Hmm. Okay, cool. Heidi, did you have an example that you could share for um, something a bit different? Sure. Um, so if you start into the market and you're only selling one specific item uh, and it's gone really well and you're looking at what additional things you can be doing you can take a look at if you possibly there's a different technique that can improve your product or that could kind of segue you into another portion of your craft that would align well with the original product so for instance i started out just making mugs for a local um a local shop and I was really interested in 3D printing at the time. And I ended up deciding that it would be great to be able to offer the same mugs, but with company logos on them. Mm -hmm. So what started as, here's a generic logo mug with Pittsburgh on it. Now I'm able to illustrate things and take other people's illustrations and other people's logos expand them and 3D print them, and then apply them to the front of a mug. Uh, I just did, added a product that was ice cream bowls for mm -hmm. a local ice cream company. I hope they're a good uh, size. They're decent. You can, you can <laughs> fit like three groups of ice cream in them. They're, they're nice little deep bowls so that you can put all of your toppings on and they're not all just going to try and fall off the sides. Um, but... Just looking for those little things too, aside from like big movements or big diversifications where you're teaching or you're doing all mm. those big movements, you can do soft moves with your business to add additional market products that would bring in different clientele. So maybe you're at a show and a lot of people are coming up to you and they're like, oh, I just can't add another one of these things to my, mm. my kitchen. Um, for me that it's, it's, oh, I don't want to buy another mug. Right. Yeah. Like I have an entire collection of mugs. Do you have anything else? Uh, and you know, I, I now have these ice cream bowls, but prior to that, I was making dog bowls. Yeah. Uh, prior to that, it was planters. So using the same technique of making the mugs, just not adding a handle and putting a hole in the bottom. Now I suddenly have a planter. So it doesn't really deviate so far from my original craft, um, but allows me to still kind of have those in that same kind of price point area, but just a different use. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's it's very important as well that if if you are you're enjoying the making process but you're trying to make money from it in a business it's very important to realize that 
if people are willing to give you money for a product and it's within the realm of your skill set to make it with a minor adaptation to what you're already doing, then it's probably worth taking that on board and, and giving it a go. Because if it's not, you know, if you're not going to suddenly have to outload a load more money for tooling or, you know, changing of technique or whatever else, like you said, you know, you, you're not having to put a handle on something and then you're pushing a hole in the bottom, you're, you're basically saving time making the planters in some respects, aren't you? Um, mm -hmm. So that that's a whole sort of different realm of um, diversification within your already your your wheelhouse of what you're doing without having to then spend time drawing up plans or setting things up. It's interesting as well, though, that you're you talked about the the 3D print elements of it because you um, you obviously have a separate skill set with the design side of things, and it's it's allowed you to incorporate that into your craft uh in a in a roundabout way with with the manipulation of of um designs and things like that with working with 3d prints um which i think quite often um myself included when you sort of start going down a craft route you think oh this is completely separate from everything i've been doing but in actual fact there's quite often little skills that you can use that just accentuate it and just lift it up to a different level and set you apart as well um from other people i mean it's never it's not necessarily a unique selling point but it can be a step on the way to, to getting there which can increase your sales overall yeah um, and and the other thing with those stamps just to add something is that i can also sell those to other potters mm. so that's that's something that you know it was an additive for my business but then when other people saw that i could make them and make them pretty quickly um, I started getting requests for different things. There, there were several different local potters and a couple uh, around my state that were looking for something that a rubber stamp wasn't going to be able to do for them. And I had already kind of cracked the egg, so to speak. Like I already figured out how to how to open it up and and be able to do it in a way that was successful for myself. Uh, mm. And it was just basically like, here's my process. Uh, if you want to do it, you can buy a 3D printer and do all this stuff. And then they're like, well, will you just make it for me? <laughs> and yeah, so and that's pretty a lot cool. of them were like, yeah. I'll pay you. And I'm yeah. like, oh, you'll pay me for this? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So that's cool because they they trust you because you are a potter, but you're then using the technology and they, they don't they don't have that skill set or they don't want to put the time in. As, as we said earlier, you know, you're paying someone else to do the thing. But you've got that added element of that you use it yourself in your own craft. So um, there's a bit of a bit of share around there. It's a little bit when like um, people generate uniform for themselves for their brand and they're wearing a uniform and people who want to support you, but they really like the logo on your T-shirt. And they're like, I just want to buy a T-shirt. Like, I, I, I don't want any of your product in my house, but I want to support you. Do you do merchandise? And it's that kind of weird conversation. We're like, no, I, I kind of got this for me just as a uniform <laughs> just to set myself apart for when i'm working but you want to pay me money for this okay so um you can suddenly end up finding yourself doing merchandising and, and talking about things like that um which again can be kind of uh passive revenue if you if you set it up with teespring or something similar depending on on the level of quality that you want to generate uh, you did also mention something briefly heidi about um teaching which obviously is is slightly different and it's something that i know rasmus does and i've done um and i think you at one point were, were gearing towards doing that hopefully now with your new studio you might have space to be able to do that um i think it is a different skill to learn i've been teaching now for coming up to three years i think and i do i do a couple of courses a month a variety of different ones whether they're half day full day and all that kind of stuff um some of it specifically wood turning some of it machine maintenance and all that kind of thing um and there's definitely a revenue stream there that could be relatively lucrative um so it all depends on your setup you'd have to have the correct insurances you'd have to have the correct kind of you know health and safety element but also just just space so i i would suggest anyone if they're looking or being asked to do teaching um if you're fortunate enough to have a space or can borrow a space that allows you to teach three or more people then it's probably going to be more worthwhile looking into it um because it's more cost effective 
all depends obviously on what your craft is and what you're teaching i mean heidi you, you need a wheel um whereas you need a, an anvil and a forge and mm. all that kind of stuff mine i need a lathe um so all of us have got not expensive but they're certainly not inexpensive equipment that you can you, you can't easily pack it into a car and take it to like a village hall and set it up and teach five people um so if you have got a craft where you are able to take it like there's a lady i know who does a lot of uh, willow weaving into baskets and things like that so she's mm. pretty much able to, to pack up the willow in the back of the, the van and go any large space and within reason teach you know up to eight people or something like that at once um but you've got to remember if you look at the teaching side of things it's not just the teaching time it's the preparation before it's the tidy up afterwards and all that mm. kind of stuff so factoring in that timeline does also impact on on how much you need to charge per head uh, and how many people are there so um i i, I think it's quite a good revenue stream um but yeah. i think you've just got to be prepared and well worth the first few times you want to teach maybe ask a bunch of friends around and, and teach them just to sort of like do a, a dry run with it or maybe offer the, the you know the first paid one you offer at half price or something so that people like they, they they're willing you know they, they accept the fact that there might be times where you suddenly go oh hang on a minute sorry that's not right i need to i need to change things or I attended a, a pastry course not so long ago, and the lady helpfully pointed out that she'd accidentally written 14 grams of salt, not 1.4 grams of salt, on mm. uh, one of the things. And she, the only pen she had to change the recipe was like a really big marker pen. So, <laughs> so it didn't, she couldn't like color in this tiny little dot. Um, but she hadn't yeah. realized until after she'd taught the first class and she'd already had the recipe printed up like 100 times or something. So, yeah. you know, everyone makes mistakes, but it's, um, it's well worth looking at do you find it's a good resource for us teaching do you think that that works well as a yeah uh i think it's probably one of my biggest revenue streams mm. is teaching not only just the money coming from teaching and me now having a workshop where it doesn't take me more than maybe half an hour to reorganize and set it up with teaching versus me doing production work yeah and like having that op opportunity of just being able to turn around and saying, oh, we're teaching today. Cool. It's ready. And then doing it and having like almost like a curriculum that I'm doing with students where like I had know exactly what steel we're going to use. More often than not, I cut up enough for three classes at a time and just have it on the shelf. Yeah. And I have been teaching the same curriculum so often that it is a lot of muscle memory. It is not that difficult for me to uh, convey the information. But at the same time, I realize that for every single class, I always forget to say something and I do say something in a new way. And depending on how that goes, I realize that, oh, I didn't need ever to say that, at least not with this group of students. They just got that concept because of all the other things I said. Yeah. yeah. And all of those things. But another part of it for me is like, I, I I do sell a bit of tools, especially for knife making. So me having people come in, learn how to make a knife on the tools I'm selling, makes selling those tools a lot easier. But then again, even if they don't buy it from me, they at least look to me as quote unquote, some kind of expert. Yeah. And they will look to me for advice later on, or if they want to upgrade or look for advice, then they'll come from me. And that sort of kind of helps build my brand in all of this as someone you can talk to, someone who... Well, someone you, you trust, can... you trust their opinion and, and yes. that kind of thing. That, yeah. That's the word I was looking for, trust. <laughs> it's a foreign concept here in Norway. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say about that, actually, because that's something that... Um, so where I teach is, is in my day job working in a... So we have a retail environment which uh, sells wood, wood, woodworking tools and machinery and timber and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and we have a teaching room and I teach wood turning in there as I mentioned, um, and more often than not on a day's wood turning course, if not at lunchtime, then at the end of the day, out of the five students I have, at least four of them will have bought something from the shop. Now, you know, it might be something small, it might be a bottle of finish or something like that, um, but then it goes right the other end. I had a lady come in on Saturday who I taught six months ago, and she's just had her shed finally delivered, 
And she came in with a budget and she bought her lathe, her sharpening system, her chuck, her wood turning tools, her respirator, like, you know, nearly two grand's worth of kit, wow. which she had told me six months ago she would do when she had the money. And yeah, you know, fortunately, I'm not relying on that for my personal income. But on the flip side of that, if I was to teach privately, and then I've got people coming to me and saying, hey, I, I want to buy stuff now. What do I get and where do I get it from? Mm. there is an element of your giving money away to another company because you're saying, well, I, you can't buy it from me, but you, I would recommend you get it from these people. Um, and now, you know, there's, there's two ways that you can still benefit from that. One would be maybe you set up a relationship with the companies that you're recommending. If you do truly believe in their product and maybe they would be willing to do some form of affiliation scheme where, if the person either buys online or face to face using a code you've given, you get a little bit of a kickback. Um, the other one would be a lot more work, but if you have a range of products that, like Rasmus, you either make yourself that you can sell or you import yourself that you can sell that you again believe in and use yourself, that would help boost your sales. But equally, that might not be as important to you. You know, sharing the knowledge and the information and, and just passing the torch on a little bit um might be enough for you um it's, it depends on how far you want to take it you know you, you end up having to have storage space for for sales stock and all of that kind of thing so they, they, there can be a lot of other things to bear in mind in there i mean the same thing as well goes with demonstrating so i do a yes. few demonstrations I, I do paid demonstrations um i go to a few wood turning clubs who invite you out there's a two-hour demonstration you give uh, and they pay you for the time and for travel there and back, um, which would all be pre-agreed before you go out. But one of the best ways in making sure that you maximize that time, because it's normally an evening, is to take stock to sell. You know, and that's not of the finished product you're demonstrating because they're wanting quite often in that environment, they see you do the thing and then they want to try and copy that and go and do it themselves. So if you've got tooling or finishes or anything else you've used in that, um, it can be a good way of, of just boosting those sales numbers. You're there anyway, you've brought the vehicle anyway, you may as well load it with some stuff that you can then sell on to them at the time. Um, okay, so we've we've talked a little bit about all the ways that, that you can diversify with money. Um, you know, one of the others can be, um, both both of you are a lot better at this than I am, is design time. Um, I think both of you have been asked by other people, could you design a thing for me because they don't have that skill set? Mm. Uh, Heidi, would you like to talk a little bit about that? I know it kind of crosses over into what we were just saying with the 3D printing. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously you don't have to give specifics of finances, but um, it's certainly something that is a skill set you both have that I don't. And I would come to you guys and say, hey, can you design me this for this regard? Sure. Uh, I get a lot of people coming to me that want something specific for an event or maybe a gift that is thematic. And what they usually come to me with are a bunch of ideas like, oh, I, I saw this on Pinterest. I saw this. Um, can you make it more personal? And usually, you know, we sit down and we kind of talk through the expectation on it. And we maybe ideate based on some of the things that I've made in the past. Um, there's something that's springing to mind right now is I was doing a lot of building illustrations for a local coffee shop that lives in a very historic area in Pennsylvania. So like every building is a historical landmark. <laughs> so we were basically taking a picture of the front of the building and then I was illustrating it very crudely so that I could make stamps. And this individual saw that, saw what I was doing and said, you know, my parents built their own home. And it's it's a um, it's a landmark in our town. Is it possible for you to illustrate the face of that and turn it into Christmas ornaments? Um, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So talk about diversifying the <laughs> the product line. I hadn't really yeah. done ornaments much before, but on top of that, I was able to go kind of utilize some of my design elements to mm. illustrate this house. And then they asked for the files because yeah. they wanted to get them embroidered on things. Yeah. And, you know, um, so in that case, it was kind of a digital asset 
uh, yeah. that I was able to share out. So then it kind of brought to mind, okay, well, what if I just did a lineup of different buildings within Pittsburgh that are really important or, you know, different things like that. So it's like, it's in my, um, it's in my idea box. I haven't executed it yet. Mm. And, you know, just to go back to the Sasquatch too, yeah. um, you know, I, I get a lot of people asking me to kind of build on that idea and maybe do t-shirts or do illustrations for them to be able to use in their craft. So whether they're like, you know, lasering on, um, or the one guy was lasering on, um, the, those roll boards that you make for rolling cigarettes and, and oh, right. yeah. uh, cannabis cigarettes. Mm -hmm. So I, I did that for him. So it's like, like what we were talking about with the stamp making, it's also this added thing that is in my wheelhouse to do design. I understand how line work works, how vector is important to get mm -hmm. really crisp lines. I, I understand that part of it because of my printing and graphics history. Um, so then I'm able to apply it. So I think it's, it's really important to not be afraid of using those other skill sets to maybe... Yeah um build build on what you're making but also build on some themes for other people i think it's quite interesting isn't it because when you when you consider this most of us who are creative do not have a restive brain <laughs> and by that i mean you know like ideas are always coming to the forefront and i know rasmus you've you've got notebooks and, and notes and like any any of us who are creative if we if we hand on heart say that we haven't got either a notebook somewhere with ideas scribbled on it or a or an app on our phone with ideas in it or recorded or whatever, um, then I, I would challenge that strongly and say that and I'd be very suspicious if that's actually the case um, because we can't allow ourselves to stop kind of conceptualizing. And more often than not, a lot of those ideas aren't in the same wheelhouse of the brand of we're necessarily doing so what you've just described there, Heidi, is like, you know, obviously within your skill set, but not at all something you intended to do when you were looking at making mugs and things like that um so the interesting thing with that is it's not something you've advertised you do but someone's had an idea inspired by something you've already done and then come to you and said hey if you've done that can you take it a step further and do this um and i think that that definitely leads into that whole concept of the portfolio, doesn't it? Where, you know, it, it, that whole having a digital portfolio showing somewhere, whether it's your Instagram page or your website or both or whatever, and proving, hey, I've done stuff in the past that might make you think I'm capable of doing other things. Um, and we're open to ideas and we're willing to play. We're willing to challenge ourselves. We're willing to kind of do things that aren't always the same job every time because repetition can get boring. Um, and it's good to have different things to play with. Absolutely. Um, and I mean, that leads into a little bit. I've had a brief conversation with the maker. It's, you know, nothing's gone forward with it at the moment, but you guys both know about a potentially subcontracting a uh, bit of a turning job. Um, they're looking at ways of, of making a specific product and um, they haven't necessarily got enough time to meet demand. Um, and so I've kind of looked at it a little bit and potentially offered some suggestions on, changing the way they're made slightly which would then make it faster to make them so therefore we can make more of that product or even potentially i make some of them per month or whatever for, for that particular person uh in order to help them out and you know if there's still money in it for both of us then it's not my product it's not something that i would talk about on social media it's you know it's it's a private contract it's or private commission mm. um but it's still again, generating turnover and, and generating revenue and diversifying away from my very sort of kitchen focused idea, um, which most of my products are on. Um, but that, that in itself leads on to talk about other things. If we step away a little bit from the diversification you can do to instantly bring money in, uh, and we can talk about the other things that we all do in, in various different ways that are all in alignment with our brands are um helping people to remember that we exist and do a bit of flag flying and that's talking a little bit about the kind of the, the free information if you like um the sharing of ideas um one of the things that i've liked doing the last couple of years 
is inviting specific people for what I call a family meal in the summer. Yeah. Um, and uh, neither of you have had an invite because you don't live locally to me, and that's the only reason. So before before you get offended, excuse. <laughs> before you get offended, um, but it, it's literally just like have ten people round and sit around the table outside in the summer and share a meal together that uh, has minimal involvement from then in, in having to prepare it or clean it up or any of that kind of stuff. There is no intention of social media exercise or then going and doing a task or anything like that it's just interacting with like-minded people around food um which is an awful lot of the kind of the memory for me um they may happen to all end up having to eat off wooden plates that i've made uh, and they may end up all sort of having food served to them on wooden items that i've made but that's you know that's not the, the driving force of mm. of the event um, and that's not something that I draw specific attention to either. Um, but it's, it's for me personally, it's kind of like a reminder of why I'm going down the route that I am, but it's also watching that interaction with other people between them and the product. And sort of that does tend to spark things off in my mind, um, little bits of inspiration and little bits of conversations as well. So is there um is there something that you guys do not necessarily on that scale, but you know, whether it's something again digital rather than physical that you would say that's kind of in that realm of whether it's free advice or of just support of your brand that isn't directly resulting in someone giving you money? Raz, if you've got an example of that. Yeah. Um when I moved into the current workshop, I hosted a hammer in basically a get together for blacksmiths or not for blacksmiths but to forge really uh and that was a twofold thing one was there's been a ongoing thing in the blacksmith community of forging log dogs to send down to ukraine to basically massive forging massive wooden staples to build defensive structures like trenches and things okay and as long as the front lines keeps moving they keep needing them so what I did was when I got to the workshop and I suddenly have enough space was to just send out an open invitation to anyone who wanted to come learn a bit about blacksmithing, but more, most importantly, just make a lot of log dogs and then have them shipped down to Ukraine to help down there. Like partly is like, this is a really nice, simple thing that blacksmiths have a unique set of skills to do, but also it's kind of nice to especially for me who work alone so much, to be surrounded by other competent blacksmiths and share ideas and talk and bond a little bit. And then again, there's the whole marketing thing of like, I'm showing off my business. I'm showing off the values I yeah. have and the reason behind my business. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's really important. And you've, you've just reminded me of, um, uh, there was a, a friend of mine who came and visited recently and we, and he's a listener to the podcast. So we'll shout out to Nathan Savory. Um, so he's, he's a wood turner and he was talking about how when they, they set up, he and his wife set up their um, studio uh, here in the UK and they did an open day. They did like a, you know, a grand opening. They had a ribbon and they cut the ribbon and you know, the whole kind of thing. Um, and he explained how it wasn't just, Hey, come and look at my shop. It was it was a reintroduction to people about their brand ethos. So, for instance, the food that was served there was from the cafe over the road. The yeah. drink that was served there was the drink that they had at their wedding, which was a non-alcoholic sparkling thing. But that was also from place round the corner. Um, the venue, you know, their workshop is part of. And I'll probably get this wrong, Nathan. Sorry, but it, it's it's a room in in effect in an old like castle stables type thing. Um, so there are several other businesses around, um, but they invited everyone on their mailing list. They invited friends and family, but they also invited some of their suppliers. And we're actually quite surprised when representatives from some of their suppliers turned up to their like open day event. Oh. Um, but it was you know he had have a go sessions with small children introducing them to wood turning on the lathe in a safe environment and you know it was this very much a case of it wasn't just come and look at my shop but it was like hey we are a brand and we're about being local and we're about being part of a community and we want you to share in our journey 
um, and we want you to see that we, we are genuine and this is what we are, rather than just, oh yeah, hi, we've opened a shop, come buy things. Um, so I think the way that you've you've kind of you've moved into a new shop, so you've you've introduced people to the fact that you're there, but you've done it in a way which is also then giving back, and it's not just oh I've opened a shop, come and look at it, which is you know quite a sterile way of doing things, um, yeah. and you know it it doesn't necessarily show an understanding of of where you feel your place is in the local society and community and and all of that kind of stuff. So. Yeah. Um, and I also yes. think like it's uh it's a whole lot easier for people to relate to you when you show what's important to you. Yeah. Like morally and what your value system is based upon. And if people like you, then of course they are also more likely to give their money to you when they need stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Which is why we need a chocolate sponsor for this podcast. So if one is listening <laughs> and was willing to donate all of us chocolate to keep us going, then that would be greatly appreciated. Um, <laughs> um, Heidi, I wanted to um, almost give you the answer to the question before we get started. You're really good at doing the live streams. Um, and you're in that fortunate position where when you're at the wheel, other than the kind of the noise of the wheel and occasional splashes of water, it's not too loud. So you can't, it doesn't stop you from interacting whilst you're doing what you're doing. Uh, it'd be very difficult for Raz to do that and very difficult yeah. for me to do that. Um, and you've been doing live streams for a number of years now, and they're always a delight to watch. But the bit I wanted to touch on was the fact that you're, you're very open and willing to share your knowledge on stuff. So they're, they're quite an educational thing. Um, how, you know, how did your live stream start? Was it kind of a, right, I'm, I'm on my own in my workshop doing my thing. I don't really want to listen to music. You know, maybe I can, was it, was it initially a social thing or was it um, part of a, a planned kind of, well, hey, let's, let's tell the world I'm here and what I'm doing? Uh, well, I would say I did them pre-pandemic, but they weren't as polished. I guess. Um, so during the pandemic, our our friends put together what was called the virtual craft uh, yeah, yeah. episodes. Like they would do like a Saturday virtual craft event. Hmm. And very similar to like if you went to an actual physical event, you went to a place where there were a lot of different um, disciplines happening where they were doing different timed sections where it was like oh here's a wood turner over here and here's somebody doing blacksmith and glass blowing and ceramics um it was basically an attempt to get everyone still active in the community and be able to kind of share their workshops share their knowledge and everything like that and i really enjoyed it and i really i liked being able to talk through my process because number one the more practice you have in talking through what you're doing as you're doing it, the better you will be as a teacher mm -hmm. and the more relaxed you will be in the process too. Like if something happens, like the camera falls in the water or, <laughs> you know, you, um, you flub up a piece and there's a bunch of people watching. It doesn't feel as um, anxiety inducing. It's just kind of yeah. like, Oh, been here, been, de dealt with this before. Um, I just need to pause, clean up what I was doing, kind of talk through what I did wrong because it's a teachable mm -hmm. moment as yeah. my dad would say. And it just kind of evolved from there, from being this need within our community to stay in touch because yep. we weren't able to see each other. And now there's a lot of, I, I think the wood turning community probably does this the best. Um, they will do, you know, two hour live sessions with multiple cameras. They'll have yeah. a laptop that they control and they've got their mic'd up and they're turning and they're explaining each of their steps. And I was really interested in that. Like, how, how are they able to control all of that? The one thing that's a challenge for me, uh, and I don't do multiple cameras, is that my hands are completely covered in mud yeah. <laughs> uh, and messy mud, too. It's yeah. It's like sloppy so i might you know change the orientation of my camera a little bit so you can kind of see that step in the process a little bit i change it up every time depends on my mood i don't um 
I don't publicize it. I just go live. Whoever's yeah. around, great. Whoever's, you know, misses it, you know, I might take clips from it and post it later on some feed. But for the most part, it's really just like, hey, if you're here, I'm here. This is what I'm doing. And as far as like sharing knowledge, I came up in the ceramics community in a pocket that is all about free access. Mm-hmm. Uh, and not commoditizing learning. Yeah. And I see a lot of this right now. And, and we kind of talked through this a little bit of, you know, selling classes or or commoditizing classes. And sometimes that feels a little ick to me okay. when it's when it's like online classes, not so much like yeah. physically, because you are you are giving of your time when someone comes into your shop, you're giving them the tools, you're using your fuel, you're using your space, materials and everything. Um, but these, these online practices of kind of monetizing and gatekeeping knowledge mm-hmm. by way of, you know, these platforms that are like, hey, this exorbitant amount of money and then you can get access to like this really minute little bit of information Yeah, um, feels like it's kind of the opposite of what my practice is about. And I call it a practice on purpose because it, it is, it's almost a spiritual practice, you know, Mm -hmm. like I meditate when I throw, Mm -hmm. um, I spend a lot of time thinking about, emotions of of my day and and different things and I don't know I just I grew up in a, in a space like I did go to college I did pay for school to to get this knowledge because yeah. it wasn't readily available to me but with the ability now to kind of share the craft that I think a lot of people in a lot of different respects thinks is dying colleges mm-hmm. are getting rid of some of these crafts completely as yeah. a curriculum and there aren't large spaces to practice ceramics there aren't there aren't a whole lot of opportunities to get the schooling and education that sort of certifies you as like you know what we historically would call a master ceramicist yeah. or a master potter um because it's dying i feel less inclined to hop on that bandwagon and sell online mm-hmm. courses. I don't know. It just makes me feel l- a I little, did, eh, so I'm not sure. I understand, I understand what you're saying. I mean, there's, um, you know, speaking from wood turning perspective, I, I personally, if someone asked me to do a demonstration, I would do it in person. I, I won't do an online demonstration. If that means that they can't do it because the cost is too high so if someone in the north of england said hey like you know down we want you to come and demonstrate at our local club well hey that's a five-hour drive each way so there's going to be an overnight stay plus the whatever that would be the cost and obviously if they're not willing to pay that then unfortunately i don't do that demonstration mm. i understand the alternative that guys offer where hey i can do a remote demonstration but for me i need the interaction with the people like I can't, I can't just talk to the void and go like, are, are people asleep? <laughs> you know, like I, I need to, I need to see the audience. I need to be able to feel the room type thing, um, which is a weird thing to say and possibly not easy to understand if you've never spoken in front of a group of people or demonstrated in front of a group of yeah. people. Um, but I, I, so it's similar sort of thing. Like there are there are practical things that I don't feel can be taught online uh i think if it was um you know if if it was a if it's a subject that's around how to use a software program and everyone's there and they're they're following along exercises on their own computer and the way it's set up and you're kind of like you're talking to, through them remotely that's a different thing but like i totally get what you're saying like i i could not me personally understand how i would be able to learn how to do pottery from someone showing me via a video screen and I'm there with like, I've possibly got a really cheap wheel or one that I've homemade myself and isn't working quite the way that theirs is. And they can't see the way I'm sat or the way I'm holding something. And so I I want that 
interaction with the tutor who's able to come along and go just drop your elbow a little bit or just do this or shift your center of gravity and you'll find this easier or, or whatever it might be or you know in, in your case Rasmus you know like swing from the shoulder not swing from the elbow and you yeah. know all, there, there's so many nuances to the physicality of of what we all do and that's in every craft that mm. trying to teach that remotely I think would be really challenging um, I, so yeah i would have to agree with you heidi that i'm not i'm not comfortable with the idea of of charging money for sort of remote learning or the physical processes if you're talking theory that's a bit different um but yeah i i would i would definitely struggle charging for that as well if if i may be a bit difficult then mm -hmm. i i'm thinking there's quote unquote all these rooms to charge for it but you will be judged upon what you give away for free. Mm -hmm. In the sense that if you're giving, them a, giving away a certain amount of knowledge for free, arbitrarily this much, people will think that what you have behind a paywall will be exponentially more valuable than that. Yeah. So the more you can give away for free, while still contain some value to give behind a paywall, the quote unquote easier it is for people to justify that because they think, oh, this is the amount that I can learn just for free. And you will feel like that's enough, but then you also hit the wall of going like, well, my skill isn't developing anymore. Let's go in here and actually look at what's the big pay thing. But then you can also break it down, at least in my mind, kind of in three tiers. And granted, like I have kind of all three of these going on. I have the physical classes. That is a day or two. I would love to be able to teach for a week because then you can really go into the minutia of a technique or a concept. But even if it's just for a week, you can do the physicality thing. You can check people's posture and technique, and you can get the adjustments outside to make them feel better. But then I'm also writing the school book, the new school book in blacksmithing here in Norway. And that's a lot of theory. That's a lot of concepts that if you have a even a vague mental grasp of them before you do anything physical, everything gets a lot easier. And that's a book that it's currently on development and that I send to every single student a week before the class. So they pay for it. And I also will send them the updated version as every time I update it as a bit of marketing. But also, you bought in early to trust me to make this better. Here's the reward. So, I'm so hang on a minute. This is the book you haven't finished yet and you've been writing for a couple of years and you're already yep. selling it. Yeah. But I'm selling it as a concept, <laughs> as something in development. And mm. every, every single, single time I kind of add another chapter, I up the price a little bit. So, I mean, that, don't get me wrong, that, that's, um, that's absolutely valuable, but that, that's also where you and I would differ because I would not be able to send out something that is not finished yet. <laughs> I'd be like, no, no, it's not perfect yet. I can't let you touch this or see it or anything. Well, it needs yeah. to be fully covered. It needs to have a really cool logo and, and images. And <laughs> But then there's also days when I would like to eat. Yes. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I don't have that second revenue stream. Like, everything I do doesn't yeah. need to bring me money, but I, I, I kind of had to force myself to look at, well, can I get a little bit back from this? Yeah. Uh, but my third thing I was thinking of is, like, the plans for the roses. Just a project. Here's a thing with concrete tips to make this specific thing. It doesn't describe any of the major techniques in blacksmithing, but it tells you just a few things you need for this thing. Mm. And you can charge for all of these things, depending on how technical or in-depth or how much time you put into creating them. Yeah. But I would still emphasize the fact that if you can give away a lot of this for free, then the upsell is a lot easier. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think there's something as well that um, a, a Master Wood Turner told me once, because someone queried with them about, um, or in fact, I, I queried with them about you know, you've just spent a day like teaching this bunch of people exactly how you do one of your pieces. Mm. And this guy's pieces sell for about three thousand pounds a piece. Like you know, he and this guy was sharing all of his techniques, all of his tricks, like the products he uses and everything else. It's like, why are you so willing to do that? And he just looked me dead in the eye and said, Because they won't be able to do it as well as I will. Yeah. Yeah, it's like I've I it, like what I am showing you that looks super easy has taken me a decade of practicing this like one variant of this one shape, 
mm. and then all of the embellishment afterwards. And that, so he's got 10 years worth of knowledge. And in a five hour stint, he has shared a portion of it that would be enough to get people well on the way to making the thing. But if you put theirs next to his, they would definitely not look the same. Yeah. And it was like, and he said, the other thing is, he said, which sounds very arrogant, they haven't got my name. Yeah. No, and no, that and that's the other element of it is, is you if you build up the brand of your name or your, your business enough up and people know you for that thing, then they want to buy the thing with your name on it, not the mm. thing that was made by one of your students necessarily, certainly not beginning times. So th there is also that element of not being too precious if you know that if you know that what you make is unique enough and that, you know, the way that your hammer strikes fall or the way that your hands have shaped a piece or whatever it is, if you know that it is unique enough that someone can make something that's a similar thing to it mm. and it's not going to affect you, um, then I don't see the reason for gatekeeping, like you said earlier, Heidi. Like, you know, we, I think we're all of a generation where we, we crave the knowledge and we get really frustrated if it's being held back by someone with no logical reason to it and they want to just die with the knowledge as being their own. Uh, and they've not even written it down anywhere or or whatever yeah. the case may be. Um, because, you know, some crafts are just going. Yes, Heidi. There are, within the ceramics community, there are different things that um, people do uh, look at as precious and monetize, right? Uh, it's glaze mixes. Mm -hmm. Like they they got this very specific color and they spent 10, 20 years perfecting it. And they put their name on the glaze and you buy that recipe from that person. Yeah. Um, but there are also very altruistic groups that build things like there's a platform called Glazy. And Glazy has all of that chemistry written yeah. out per yeah. recipe. Um, there, there are world famous potters from history that it is important to catalog that because one of the things that happens over time, and we're talking centuries, is that certain techniques get lost to time and not right. having it recorded makes it very difficult. I think in blacksmithing, probably you guys are still discovering things that ancestors have done. And you're, and some people are like, oh, this is new technology. And you're like, no, no this mm. has been done forever. Like we, I think at one point we had been having a side conversation between the three of us about steam engines and yeah, that yeah. they existed well before America. <laughs> yeah. Ancient but, Greek. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So like there are things that Dan, to your point can be precious, mm -hmm. can be, yep. you know, I hung my hat on this technique because I was the inventor of the technique. Yes. And I will teach people how to do it, but they'll never be able to surpass me yeah. uh, unless they put the same amount of time in. And there are other things that people think that they own because of their grit. You know, like mm -hmm. I have just pursued this darn red color uh, for years and years and years and years to perfect some idea of a red that I yeah. wanted. And it's mine and no one else can have it because yeah. it's my Frankenstein, right? Mm -hmm. Or my my monster of Frankenstein. <laughs> and um, and then there are other situations where I, I guess I didn't think because I have a full-time job um, and I have the luxury of having yeah. this as a quote-unquote side hustle that it is important to be able to find value in everything so that you can eat. Um, so I don't want to completely take back what I was saying about <laughs> feeling ick about no, selling no, 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 online no. courses, but, um, I can see the value in, in being able to do them correctly where mm -hmm. maybe it wouldn't, it wouldn't hinder my personal values about it. Mm. I just like looking at some experiences that I've had with trying to learn from other people online yeah. and how the value, the dollar value didn't equate to the actual learning value yeah. Yeah. Uh, is, is probably more where I feel kind of cheated. If I may elaborate a little bit mm -hmm. and by all means, I, I perfectly get your point and I, I do fully agree on it. And for me, it is kind of finding that balance between being stingy and squeezing money out of people and living true to my values of just sharing knowledge. And 
I think for me, it very easily boils down to a simple thing. And that is, are you my friend? If a friend comes up to me, ask, ask for advice, I will always share it. But if an absolute stranger comes and pesters me and asks me every single minute detail in the production of something or in techniques, then it's like, no, I, I don't have time to help every single one. So writing it down and putting a price tag on it means that if I don't know you or you are not able to get to know me, just pay the money. You can get everything there. And then, of course, if you've read that and have specific questions, that's a lot easier for me to deal with than trying to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with everyone and educate them on everything I think I know. Yeah. Yeah. I like there's that. Definitely, yeah, it's definitely a, um, an element. I, I see it in you know, a slightly different way in retail where you'll, you'll get an email or a phone call from someone asking for information. And the email is the one that's more frustrating than anything else. It's because they they are asking for information that is available on the website. Mm. So they've they've spent and and trying to find the the contact email on that website is probably harder than having found the information that they were looking for on the website. And it won't be something specific. You know, it won't be like, oh, I want the dimensions for such and such. It will it will, it will literally be a question like, do you sell this thing? It's like, well, if you use the search engine on the website that you've gone on to and type that thing into it, you will find it. But instead, you have to send them an email bank back with a link to it. And, you know, then you sort of start to preempt any other questions. Yes, it's in stock. This is the delivery time. This is the, mm. you know, and you're providing all this data, which is available already to them. But they've not put, they, they don't want to put the effort in. They want to be handed the thing straight away they, they they literally don't want to you know and that that's probably doing some people a disservice but the, the ones who kind of they've not done the prior research or they've if this is the first time they've encountered a craft and they're coming to you and asking a load of questions if they don't accept the fact that you're going to say to them hey look there's a lot of information you're after here and right now that is not the time for me to give it all but i do run a class mm -hmm. you're welcome to come to the class we can we can get you on the way um there is going to be a fee there's going to be an element of that because i'm you know my favorite one is when i'm sat in my van eating my lunch and someone caps comes and taps on the window and i'm like dude i've literally got a sandwich in my mouth you know like <laughs> this is this is clearly personal time i've taken myself away from all of the buildings and i'm not even in like the canteen area i have locked myself away in my own little bubble i can't make it much more obvious mm. um but you know, at the same time, that, that you know, there's a time and a place. But also, if the person is not the friend, if you've never met them before, then there's there's definitely going to be a different conversation happening. Rather than um, the thing that I tend to do, which is really impersonal, and this is how you'll know if you're my friend or not. I won't send you a message going, "Hi, how are you?" I'll just go, "What was the answer to this thing that I need to know right now?" Yeah, and then <laughs> if I get the answer, I'll just be like, "Thanks, bye." because that's I'd, where I'd my head is <laughs> and that's where my head is right at the moment is i need to know the answer to this one question that's really specific and i've contacted you because i think you'll know the information and if you don't know the information that's fine but i'll then move on to someone else so apologies to anyone that i do that to which is all of my friends um <laughs> all of the time it, you know it's it's the way that the brain works for me rather than um establishing and polite conversation and gradually working your way towards finding the answer for something because I know you well enough that I, I just haven't got the time <laughs> the time to be nice, which sounds yeah. horrible. Because uh, no, I know, uh, I know none I, of you take it personally. <laughs> I, I do the same, though. But kind of my excuse, quote unquote, is it's a lot more efficient for both of us to just jump straight to the topic. Yes. And not go through all of the pleasantries. It's, it's the YouTube effect of forget about introducing the video and telling us what's going to be in the video. I've clicked on the video because of the subject title told me I was going to see a thing. If you give yeah. me a 10-minute introduction before I've got to the thing, then your video is not getting watched. I just wanted that bit of information mm -hmm. that the video title told me was in there. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, I think I think we've covered quite a lot there when we're talking about diversifying our, our revenue streams. We've talked about you know the different uh, different types of product, the, the ways that you can utilize different skills that might mean that your your products aren't always um, the ones that are on the shelf or on the website. You might have other things you do for other people. Um, you might be part of a wider project. Um, certainly, having digital assets. 
And having things that generate your revenue while you're asleep or while, while you're not having to put more effort into them is always good. Um, I mean, one of the other things that I, I had as a complete sideline, I forgot to mention there, uh, I'll occasionally go out and service people's machinery. Mm. Um, you know, there's a lot of people in my area who have bought woodworking machinery as a hobby, and it gets to a certain point where they're just, something's gone wrong and they don't quite know what it, it is. And I will go out and in effect do a, like an annual check on like a bandsaw or something like that for them. And I charge for that service. Um, that's something within my skill set that is a revenue generator. Um, but obviously you've, you've got to factor that in if you've got the, the knowledge and understanding. Um, and we've also talked a bit about the, um, you know, the other side of it, which is the the things that are not just helping your brand, but also give yourself the warm fuzzies yeah. um, because they are, you know, helping your fellow man and in, in, in broadening the the things being done for your community and for sharing a knowledge base and sharing your passion. Um, because those of us who are married, quite often the other half will only listen to so much before they get fed up. Um, so if you can find a group of people who will pay attention to you more than that, that that's that's even better. Um, okay, guys, uh, if there's nothing else that's jumping out that people particularly wanted to uh, to say on this subject, I will did go on, properly... Raz. There's always something. Yeah. Yes. Uh, did we properly mention the importance of diversifying? The importance of it? I, th I think we skipped that part. Like, well, we're kind of at the end of the podcast now, Raz. If, the, if that yeah, was yeah. the important bit, then... <laughs> <laughs> I, I know. I mean, I, I'm editing, so I can trick things. Uh, it's it's just kind of like you, you you alluded to it with mentioning how Facebook went down for twenty four hours. Facebook, Instagram, yes. And if that's your only source of revenue, your that's only source of revenue you have, then you will naturally panic. Yeah. But the more ways you can bring money in, the more different kinds of clients you can cater to. That is true to your brand and your concept. The yes. easier it is to weather all of those uncertainties that seems to be happening more and more in this world. I think, yeah, the the other point is that um I, I didn't I did skip over it, but going back to when I watched that webinar from the lady who's been sort of mentoring craftspeople for sort of 25 years, one of the things that she said on that, which I can I can believe because I know some of the people she's mentored and they they've definitely been successful with it none of the successful craftspeople that she's ever worked with or witnessed are able to live off the revenue purely from sales. Mm. All of them have a variety of other revenue streams that are coming in. And whether or not that is, you know, most of which are related to the craft, um, if you exclude all the people who have, are fortunate enough to have uh, family members or partners who are able to financially back them, the others who are successful without that are ones who do a lot of teaching or demonstrating or like you know all of these other things that we've discussed this evening mm. um and it's it's definitely you know that's not to try and put people off it you can still kind of get to a, an equilibrium where you're happy but it's just going to be a lot harder if all you're relying on is is direct sales um it, it can be it can be quite tough um particularly if you haven't got the backup then you know if you're wanting to do this and you think oh, i want to do this full time then building your portfolio of, of ways that you can generate money that relate to it is, is definitely going to get you there a little bit quicker than just relying solely on, on direct sales. So it's, mm -hmm. it's important to look at it early on and to consider things, but also not get too overwhelmed by it and allow yourself to be burnt out thinking that you've got to do everything all at once. May I also add on that last thing? That you... Diversifying is good, but you also shouldn't go so far so quickly that you are spread too thin and don't have any way of keeping up with the things you're already doing good for your business. And it's so funny hearing you say that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I am a walking contradiction at this point. <laughs> it, yeah, it's a, big, it, it's, yeah. it's a big, big difference between knowing what is correct and doing the correct thing. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, well, okay, guys. I think we've we've given people a lot to talk about. As usual, if you um, if you've got any direct comments, any direct questions for us, topics you want to talk about, uh, you can reach us at info at settingupshop dot com or setting up shop on the social medias. You can find us individually in various different places. But before we get to that, I'm going to ask if there's if there's anything new that you guys have uh, 
done recently that is directly moving you along your journey of uh, of your small business that you can think of? And we're going to go with Rasmus first this time. I need to think for a second. Like, what's the, what's the? I mean, you can pause recording here if you like. Bearing in mind the last time no, I asked no. this question was two days ago. Yeah, yeah, that, that's kind of the thing. I just need to think <laughs> of something that's a good answer that is keeping up with everything kind of stuff. Um, I thought I had something earlier, then I forgot about it. Um, Heidi, would you like yeah. to go instead? No, no, I, oh, I oh there we go. We knew that would jog his memory. Yeah, uh, I, I've actually added on a new type of class to my curriculum, and that is not a wizard only or ranger. Knife. Shut up. <laughs> uh, not only do a knife forging, but do a knife making class as well. So now you can actually come to me, spend the whole weekend, forge a blade, stick a handle on it, and make a sheath. Because well, suddenly I realized a lot of people come and want to take the class and then have questions about, well, how the hell do I turn this into something that is slightly less lethal for me while I'm using it? So that's like something no I've added on. And which, of course, is a good excuse to buy even more tools. <laughs> okay. Heidi, what about yourself? Um gosh, that's a tough one. Uh I would say I'm working on a new product for one of the local shops that I'm in. And it's a little bit different than what I'm used to doing. It's hand building and it's not a bike, know, is it? No, it's not a bike. <laughs> Um, they're little like keepsake plate bowl things where you like pinch mm. into the edge and make it round and you show your basically show your work. Um, so I have we're doing a prototype run of those and they're going to go in the shop probably next week. It's a little bit different than what I'm used to doing because mm. I'm primarily a thrower and I don't necessarily like the look of a, a raw edged piece. Um, or like dimpling from finger work or anything like that. I, it's not my usual style, but it was a direct ask because it's filling a void for them. So, mm. you know, it's, it's one of those situations. I think we, we talked a little bit earlier about like doing something because it's what someone else needs for their business versus like something that you would maybe do for your own business. Yeah. Um, so you know, it's it's a little bit different than what I'm used to doing. It's not something that I think that I'll adopt into my repertoire. Um, but it's, you know, they're nice little keepsakes that a lot of people traveling into Pittsburgh can just kind of toss in their bag and not take up a whole lot of space like a mug or, yeah, a, yeah. you know, even the mini cups that I make. So I think it'll be good for their space. Cool. I um I've been researching a range of new products that will make you guys laugh. Um, so this this is my hmm? this was this is my my year from not doing uh, events and not sort of going and doing direct sales stuff. And something that's kept cropping up over the last couple of years that people have asked for. I've got one shop that wants me to make things for them, uh, and a lot of stalls sell just this and they do quite well uh and that's lamps uh. and i i uh, those of you who know me well and i, I totally thought it was going a different direction <laughs> oh okay oh, okay we'll talk about that after show it's not that um, <laughs> yeah uh i i've had those of you who know me well i know i have a bit of a an issue it's i don't have an issue with lamps i have no problem with lamps i'm not lampist um it's it's the upcycling TV shows in the UK have a tendency that if they can't think of what to make something into, then they turn it into a lamp. And it seems to be mm. this really frequent thing. And you'll see things like the old block um, carpenter's plane, like the really nice big chunky thing. And they'll just drill a hole through the length of it, turn it on its end and shove a light bulb on it. And it's a lamp. And, yeah. and I, dislike it because it shows for me it shows like this lack of imagination like is there nothing else that you can think of to make from any of this stuff uh, there's even a, a comedian in the uk who who plays a game with his wife watching these things called lamp or not a lamp 
Like they, they place <laughs> bets as to what the thing is going to be. This is how common it is over here. Um, and so that kind of put me off for quite a while. But the um, the point is, is that people like lamps. They they want them. They like them. That you can, you know, it's quite a good project to play around with doing. And my thought process once I got over myself was a little bit along the lines of, do you know what? If you're going to put a light inside a wooden thing, then you've got to be good enough at turning that wooden thing thin enough that you can see through it. And that oh. might be another way of like pushing my skill set because at the moment everything I turn is like got a 10 mil wall thickness because mm. it's quite sort of farmhouse and it's supposed to be uh in durable for generations and all that kind of stuff. So it might be something then that that pushes my skill set to the opposite end and makes me become a bit more delicate um and a bit more artistic with things that i'm doing or it might go horribly wrong but uh it, it's certainly something that i'm i am starting to research at the moment so um yeah that that's kind of the thing that i'm i'm doing and uh, hopefully it's not going to just be a procrastination and take me too far away from what i'm i'm supposed to be doing no, i think they just you don't have a procrastination. on the uh, great pottery throwdown where they they asked the potters to make lamps Hmm. And one person actually did like the lamp and the lamp shade. Yeah. And uh, it was just, they thought a little bit outside the box versus, yeah. you know, making them that's, the body of the lamp. Yeah. Itself. I think that's the thing is, is make, I've got a couple of ideas that are, I wouldn't say unique, but I've not seen them very often. Um, and there's, there's certainly a, a number of wood turners at the moment are very good who are doing kind of the, the hanging lamp shades for like in your house and they're making these gorgeous things that look like the lattice lace work type thing and they're very thin and ornate um but you're you're talking a couple of hundred quid for a wooden lamp shade and mm. i know that my my skill level is not there yet but i'm also trying to think back to that from a commercial perspective of how do i produce something relatively quickly and within a certain price point so that people will buy enough of them that you know, it, it, it generates the interest. So I've got a couple of ideas there, which I'll share with you uh, off off the podcast. So um, finding all of us then. So myself, you can you can find at Bevelwood UK on uh, on Instagram and also Bevelwood.co.uk on my website. Uh, and any wood related questions, wood turning questions, or just questions about the podcast, feel free to send me a message on, on those either via the uh, email address or directly to me. Um, and you can find Heidi on Whitehall Pottery or at Whitehall Pottery, whitehallpottery.com, all of those kind of things. And then Erasmus, it is uh, Lowen Smed. And, yes, uh, dot N-O, yes. Dot N-O, because it's in Norwegian. Yeah. Uh, or you can find at Erasmus Lowen is uh, on his Instagram handle. And unless he's changed the image already, he is still balancing a hammer on his nose uh, <laughs> as, his, uh, as his profile picture. So thanks very much, everyone. And uh, we um, hope you enjoyed the episode as much we enjoyed recording it. And we'll speak to you next time. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.